this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the entire chapter, verses 1 through 13. I'm going to incorporate that scripture passage into the sermon today, and we are going to go through it almost line by line. So today would be a great day to follow along. In the Pew Bibles here in the sanctuary, it's on page 175 in the New Testament. And if you're watching at home, we invite you to take your family Bible and find 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. As we prepare to hear God's message to us today, let us pause for a brief moment of prayer. Lord, you have taught us in the scriptures that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word endures forever. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You'll have to forgive me if you've heard me tell this joke one too many times before. It's my favorite one, and I thought it was especially appropriate today. A frog went to see a fortune teller. He wanted to know what the future had in store for him, and particularly whether he would ever find his true love. The fortune teller, gazing deep into a crystal ball, told the frog, You are going to meet the most beautiful girl, who is going to be very, very interested in you. She will want to know everything about you, and you will open yourself up to her, and you'll give her your heart. The frog was very pleased with this, and he asked, Where and when will I meet her? On Valentine's Day? On a blind date? No, said the fortune teller, you will meet on a Monday morning in her biology class. Just a little reminder that true love doesn't always live up to our expectations. Today is, of course, Valentine's Day, a day when people around the world celebrate love. And yet often this holiday seems to have more to do with buying things and overindulging in chocolate than actual acts of kindness and self-sacrifice to others. Hollywood movies in our culture point to romantic love as our highest ideal, our greatest achievement, our happy ending that lasts forever. And yet, over 50% of all marriages in our culture end in divorce. I think we love to love love, but we don't really know how to find it, what to do with it, how to hold on to it, or even how to give it away. As a pastor, I've heard countless couples say, I just don't love her, or I just don't love him anymore. And I've heard angry teenagers say, I hate my parents. And I've heard parents say, I love my children. But then I watch how little time they spend with them. And I wonder what love even means to us when in the very next breath we can turn around and say, I love enchiladas. Or I love shopping. You see, despite all our aspirations and our very best attempts, I'm not really sure that we even really know what love is anymore, let alone how to adequately express it on the other 364 days of the year, and maybe even on this one. Fortunately for us, the Bible has a thing or two to say about love, some pointers, if you will. One of the most famous places this happens is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, also known as the love chapter. I've preached on this passage at countless weddings, but never actually on a Sunday morning until today. 1 Corinthians takes the form of a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the young church in the Greek city of Corinth. Now, Paul had founded this church sometime around the year A.D. 50, but then he left to continue planting churches in other places. Well, a few years later, he received news about his congregation in Corinth, news that while they were outwardly preaching and proclaiming a message of love, inwardly they were divided. 
bitterly fighting against each other, calling each other names and drawing lines in the sand. I think in America today, perhaps we can relate. So Paul set pen to parchment and began to write a letter that carefully addressed all of the issues that divided them, giving them detailed solutions and theological justifications and rationales for those solutions. And I like to imagine that by the time he got all the way up to 12 chapters of this, he put down his pen in exasperation, realizing and remembering that logic and reason rarely ever change anyone's position, let alone their disposition. In my imagination, Paul stops. Maybe he prays to God for inspiration. Perhaps he thinks of the example of Jesus. And then he picks up his pen again with renewed resolve. And he writes the last verse of chapter 12, which says, But now, let me show you a more excellent way. And with this, he launches into the famous chapter 13, his discourse on if I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels, he writes, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. In other words, all of the solutions to all of the problems in the world are just words, just noise. If the underlying sentiment, if what is behind those words and behind those solutions is not Right. And this is important. You cannot win an argument. You cannot change the behavior of another person. You cannot convince anyone of anything unless you love them first. Think about that. The next time you watch the news and get frustrated with those people and what they are doing, do you love them? Because if not, then lay down your weapons, lay down your words, lay down your arguments, and start there. But Pastor Neil, you might say, how am I supposed to love someone that I don't really like or even understand? That's a great question. I'm so glad you asked. And we'll get to that. But first, maybe that's not quite your situation. Maybe you are frustrated with someone you really do love. A parent, a spouse, a child, a close friend. But maybe things aren't in a good place right now. Maybe you feel the love, but that love doesn't seem to be getting through or making a difference in your relationship. I think that happens because we forget how to love, or rather how to express our love beyond cards or flowers or even words. And so Paul, starting in verse 4, reminds us what true love actually looks like. And here's a surprise. It's not made out of chocolate or anything you can buy. He says, love is patient. So, be patient with those you love, or the ones you want to love, or even the ones you don't love but really should. Love requires patience. Love is kind. So, be kind. Now, notice that the first two things in Paul's list, these have nothing to do with the other person or the other people and everything to do with you. These are things that are entirely within your control. It doesn't matter whether the person you love is not patient or not kind. 
This is all about what you are to do. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. And here Paul switches from describing what love is to what love is not, which is another way of describing love. Now, when I read those words just a second ago, be honest. How many of you thought in your mind, but I'm not boastful, which, you know, is boasting about how you're not boastful, even if it was only in your mind. When we argue with people that we love, and those we want to love, and those we don't love but should, when we argue, how often do our arguments themselves imply, I'm right about this, and you are wrong? which is almost the textbook definition of arrogance, even if you are, in fact, right. And if you do any of those things out loud, or even non-verbally with your body language, the rolling of the eyes, or the crossing of the arms, well, that's rude, and love is not rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Aha! The truth! Look, Master Neil, that's what I was doing. I wasn't arguing. I was just being honest. I was telling it like it is. I was telling the truth, and people don't want to hear the truth. Well, not so fast. Remember, love is something we do for others, not something we expect from others. Loving someone else means trying to see the truth in their words, in their actions, not upholding your own. And love means rejoicing in whatever truth you find in that other person, no matter how great or how small. Love bears all things. Does that mean I have to put up with things that are unacceptable? No. But sometimes love means carrying more than your share of the weight when the other person cannot or will not. Love believes all things. Does that mean I have to be gullible and naive? No. But it does mean choosing over and over again to believe the best about someone else rather than imagining the worst. Love hopes all things. But what if my hopes are crushed? What if the ones I love let me down? Well, that means they're human. Hope, by definition, is never a guarantee. It's a chance. It's a risk. And it's also a renewable resource that doesn't cost you anything. You can always hold out hope again and again. Love endures all things. Once again, does that mean that I have to put up with things that are unacceptable? No. Endurance is about time and commitment. Sometimes you have to take a step back or a step away from the ones you love. But love means never going too far away and always being willing to come back and try again. Paul's definition of love is not easy. In fact, it's a lot harder than buying something or saying I love you in fancy letters spelled out in red balloons. The chocolates melt and get eaten. Balloons shrivel up, and even words printed on paper fade in time. Our actions, on the other hand, our attitudes, the sacrifices we make, and yes, even our self-restraint, when done in love, these things have the power to transform a relationship, or at the very least, if they do not transform another person, they have the power to transform us, ourselves, into the kind of people worth having a relationship with. And that is worth the effort. The final section of Paul's love chapter is my favorite. 
He has told us why love is important. He's told us what love is, what it looks like. And now he's about to tell us where it's going. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror, dimly. But then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. In other words, Paul is teaching us that love evolves. The love that we give to others and the love that we have inside ourselves to give has the capacity to grow and mature in time throughout our lives and even beyond our lives. If you don't think you have enough love to give, or if you think you don't or can't love someone or a group of someones, then start small. Start by hoping and believing. God loves nothing more than to take small things, partial things, broken things, incomplete things, and in time, make them whole. Everything else you ever do in your life will come to an end. All your achievements, all your knowledge, all your words, everything you do will someday be lost and completely forgotten. But here's the promise of 1 Corinthians 13. Whatever you achieve for others out of love, whatever you learn about others out of love, Whatever you say to others in love, and whether, whatever you do for others in love, these things will last forever. Not just in this life, but in whatever lies ahead. Paul ends his letter with a very famous comparison. Verse 13 of chapter 13. He says, And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three great things Virtues, and yet the greatest of them is love. I began the sermon today with a rather disastrous love story, a story of love that didn't turn out quite as planned. So I want to end with a different kind of love story, one which I think gets to the very heart of the kind of love 1 Corinthians is talking about. It was a busy morning. Approximately 8.30 a.m., when an elderly gentleman in his 80s arrived to have some stitches removed from his thumb. He said that he was in a hurry, as he had an appointment at 9 o'clock, and so the nurse took his vital signs and had him take a seat, knowing that it would be well over an hour before someone would be able to see him. The old man looked nervously at his watch, and seeing this, the nurse decided to go ahead and evaluate his wound. While she was doing this, the two struck up a conversation. She asked him if he had another doctor's appointment this morning since he was clearly in such a hurry. The gentleman said no, but that he needed to go to the nursing home to eat breakfast with his wife. When the nurse asked about his wife's health, he told her that his wife was in otherwise good health, but she was a victim of Alzheimer's disease. The nurse then asked if his wife might be upset or worried if he was a bit late. And he replied that she no longer knew who he was, that she had not recognized him in over five years now. Well, this surprised the nurse, who said, And you still go every morning even though she doesn't know who you are? The old man smiled and said to the nurse, She doesn't know who I am, but I still know who she is. Happy Valentine's Day, people of First Presbyterian Church.
My prayer for you today is not that you might find true love, or even keep it if you've already found it. No, my prayer for you today is that you might give true love. And not just to one other person, but to everyone whom God places in your path, and more and more. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and God, you loved us, your people, your children, so much that when you saw our suffering, our brokenness, you made the decision to do something out of love, to send your beloved Son into our midst, to teach us a better way to live, to teach us how to love one another, and that that love might spread throughout the world. Lord, help us to eternalize those teachings. Help us to love others just as you have loved us. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.